It was a frigid December morning when the real estate agents entered the palatial Toronto mansion to show prospective buyers around. Nothing could prepare them for the grim discovery that awaited in the basement. The bodies of pharmaceutical tycoon Barry Sherman, 75, and his wife Honey, 70, hanging limply from belts strapped around their necks. The couple's legs were outstretched, their feet barely touching the ground, and their posed bodies slumped against the railing overlooking the indoor pool. The gruesome scene was like something out of a chilling mystery novel, not the palatial basement of one of Canada's most prominent couples. Barry and Honey Sherman were billionaires, philanthropists, and celebrities on the Toronto social circuit. Barry, the 12th wealthiest man in Canada, according to Forbes, had built a pharmaceutical empire. Investigators first thought it might be a murder-suicide when examining the strange, staged evidence. But Sherman's four devastated adult children knew better. Their parents had been targeted. They were proven right when, weeks later, after intense public scrutiny, the police admitted it was actually a double homicide, with the staged murder scene now confirmed to be a double homicide. The pressing question became, who would want the prominent Shermans dead? It turned out that Barry Sherman had no shortage of enemies who might want to do him harm. The pharmaceutical mobile was known for his ruthless, combative business tactics, earning him a reputation and a long list of adversaries. Sherman himself once shockingly remarked that he was surprised no one had killed him yet. Now, over five years later, the question of who murdered Sherman and his wife remains unanswered despite an intense investigation. This is a story of unimaginable wealth, shattered dreams, and a love story that ended in tragedy. Join us as we unravel the twisted tale of the billionaire murders. We'll chase leads, expose secrets, and ask the tough questions. So, to understand this bizarre, unsolved case, we have to go back to the beginning. Barry Sherman's story started in Toronto in 1942. Sherman's father was a businessman too, a partner in a local zipper factory. Young Barry got his first taste of business riding along with Dad, counting zippers at the factory. But tragedy struck when Barry was only 10. His father died of a heart attack, leaving his mother to support the family as an occupational therapist. He studied engineering at the University of Toronto, drawn to the program's difficult it was also at university that Sherman got his start in pharmaceuticals. He spent summers working for his uncle's company, Empire Laboratories, gaining knowledge that would serve him well. Sherman leveraged his experience at his uncle's company into even bigger success. After getting his PhD in astrophysics from MIT, he briefly dreamed of NASA before realizing business was his calling. He wanted to be his own boss. So when his uncle passed away unexpectedly, Sherman took the reins of Empire Laboratories. He eventually sold it for two million dollars, but not without family turmoil. Sherman had cousins who felt owed a portion of the sale, sparking a feud. Undeterred, Sherman founded the juggernaut Apotex a year later. The pharmaceutical giant earned $1.5 billion annually at its height. Sherman was known for his ruthless business tactics, unafraid of litigation. In 1971, he married Honey, and they had four children, one son and three daughters. Despite his vast wealth, Sherman didn't live extravagantly. Friends tell of his beat-up Ford Mustang leaking gas fumes into the cabin that he refused to replace. Even on his 50th birthday, when Honey presented him with a flashing new sports car, Sherman made her return it on the spot. Honey was known to be far more lavish, but Sherman kept her on a tight financial leash. He provided for her needs, not her wants, giving her cash for trips and shopping without control of the accounts. This dynamic breeds dysfunction in the kids too. Sherman spoiled them with millions in gifts, while Honey advocated for jobs and self-sufficiency. It was not unusual for the Sherman children to receive vastly different monetary gifts. Breeding jealousy, Honey had no will despite the family fortune and her advanced age. Before the murders, she mentioned Barry considering finally giving her a large financial gift. More money, more problems was a reality for the prominent couple. I had a wealthy friend. Similar family dynamics caused major dysfunction. Meanwhile, Honey earned praise for her philanthropy by serving on charity boards, though lauded for philanthropy and donating millions. Sherman was a polarizing figure. Some described the couple as kind, but Sherman made countless enemies over cutthroat business practices. He knowingly hiked drug prices, said a professor. An associate called him the only person with no redeeming qualities. Rival executives described him in unprintable terms. Sherman was vocal about his atheism and disbelief in free will. He knew his reputation and once remarked that it was surprising that no one had killed him. Distrustful by nature, Sherman didn't hesitate to sue. Dozens 
faced litigation over the years. In one instance, he sued contractors over his mansion. Though the work cost millions, it was never up to his standards. Sherman recovered the full amount through judgments. By the time of the murders, Sherman and Honey lived in a massive 12,000 square foot home. The lavish home where the murders occurred was located at 50 Old Colony Road in Toronto's North York. The 12,000 square foot mansion was up for sale in 2017 for $7 million, as the Shermans planned a move to an even bigger Forest Hill property. In preparation, realtors and cleaning crews were frequently coming and going. But foreboding signs emerged in December. Honey failed to appear at a board meeting on the 12th, cryptically citing stuff by email. The next day, Barry and Honey were last seen alive after meeting at Apotex to discuss new home plans. Honey was soon headed to Miami with Barry to follow. Red flags appeared that very night. Barry, an insomniac, typically made late business calls, but not this evening. He never showed up to Apotex the next day either. He was highly irregular. Meanwhile, realtors had scheduled a showing of the Sherman residence, ensuring it would be empty. On December 15th, the agents arrived with prospective buyers in tow. They toured the lavish home, unaware of the horror awaiting in the basement. The moment of truth came as the group descended the basement stairs, eager to see the much-hyped indoor pool. But as they reached the bottom, a nightmarish scene awaited. One agent spotted two figures, Barry and Honey Sherman, posing lifelessly near the pool. Grasping for explanations, she called out that they were simply doing yoga. She hastily ushered the shocked couple back upstairs. The agent asked a cleaner to check on the situation, though she knew it was likely far more sinister. The cleaner somebody returned, telling her to call the police. Yet for reasons unknown, an unbelievable hour and a half passed before she dialed 911. Responding officers found the Sherman's bodies in a bizarre configuration. They sat slumped, bound by belts, strapped around their necks. Barry's legs were crossed, just like an eerie junk sculpture nearby. Honey had additional bruising on her face. The stage scene was no random crime. The elaborate murder scene baffled investigators from the start. There was no forced entry, yet access was possible by key or lockbox code. Shockingly, early on, the deaths weren't deemed homicides. Police first theorized Barry killed Honey, then himself based on her facial bruising and the theatrical posing, but Sherman's four adult children insisted it was double murder. Thousands attended the funeral, including the Prime Minister, as the family slammed suicide speculation. The Shermans hired their own forensic team, sparring with police. Others agreed that murder and suicide seemed implausible. Six weeks later, after intense public scrutiny, police made a U-turn. New evidence of zip-tie damage on the victim's hands now points to homicide. The killer or killers had bound them, then staged the cover-up. Honey was killed on the main floor. Her body moved downstairs. Barry lacked the strength to do it alone. Her phone was found in a bathroom she never used, possibly where she fled the attack initially. On the day the bodies were discovered, Barry's papers and gloves were found strewn by the door. More ominous clues emerged. Barry's strewn papers and gloves near the door suggested he was grabbed upon arriving home. The killers took the couple to the pool area, where they escaped through numerous possible exits. Police now believe the murderer knew the layout and staged the bodies like creepy sculptures to misdirect suicide. Removing zip ties post-mortem reinforced this ruse. Crucial DNA and prints weren't promptly collected. Some suggest the police were distracted by another major case that same week. Seeking to reassure the public that it wasn't a random robbery, authorities emphasized the meticulous calculation of a targeted double murder. Yet the Sherman children called the sculptures disturbing, while Honey planned to keep them in their new home, cherishing the these bizarre artifacts. Did the killer know this intimate detail? If so, how? With no signs of forced entry, the suspect pool could be vast. Barry made countless enemies over decades of aggressive business tactics. For detectives, pinpointing one plausible suspect from the long list of people harboring grudges proved daunting. Given his many enemies, Barry's lack of home security was baffling. He knew the danger yet left doors unlocked without cameras or alarms. Right before the murders, Barry got $300,000 in legal fees from his estranged cousin Kerry Winter, who once disturbingly fantasized about decapitating Barry and rolling his head down the Apotex parking lot. When named as a suspect, Kerry admitted he had motive and opportunity, working flexible construction hours. But he denies involvement, claiming he was home watching Netflix and at a support group meeting that night. Weeks prior, Barry had pressed his son Jonathan for loan repayment, causing family tension. Barry himself owed billions, refusing to pay. Jonathan maintained their close business and personal personal bond despite this. Months and years passed without breakthroughs, frustrating the Sherman children. Would this ever be solved? A possible turn came in November 2020, when police named a person of interest. But days
days later, they backtracked. It could be multiple suspects. Silence followed until December 2021, when investigators issued a dramatic public plea alongside security footage of an unknown figure near the home that night. The individual was covered head to toe by the snow, but the blurry video provided few usable clues. Between 5'6 and 5'9 in height, no age, weight, or gender could be determined. An unusual gait was noted, possibly explained by trudging through snow. After four years, why is this just being released now? And all that could even be gleaned was that the timing placed this person suspiciously near the scene that night. Many felt disappointed that this long-awaited reveal wasn't the bombshell breakthrough anticipated. Investigators made a public plea for this suspect to come forward, but no one ever did. Honey's sister suggested the killer was making a statement, offering religious motives. Court documents noted the Sherman's vocal support of Israel and Jewish identity. Could this tie to the murders? Mention also surfaced of two strange men touring the home days prior, observing the layout. Though this lead fizzled, it introduced the prospect of multiple killers. Tensions between the Sherman children further complicated matters. Recently, Alexandra Sherman reaffirmed a $10 million reward for information leading to closure in her parents' case. More mixed signals came when Jonathan Sherman offered an additional $25 million reward, bringing the total to $35 million, even as family discord continued. Ideally, the four children would unite, but divisions remained clear. The intimate nature of the murders by ligature strangulation suggested a personal motive, not a random contract kill. And despite the Sherman wealth, financial gain seemed unlikely since the children inheriting fortunes pushed hardest to investigate foul play. Barry's unconventional business dealings raised suspicions, but nothing concrete tied them to the crime. Rather, the meticulous staging implied unique knowledge of Sherman's routines and home layout. Many now believe the killer was someone they knew. The upstairs belt used as a murder weapon fuels speculation that this was no expert assassin. The intimate nature of manual strangulation points to someone familiar. Did the Shermans recognize their killer yet do nothing? Barry's billions were tied to Apotex, now sold and tied up in legalities, but set to pay out dividends to the children. They criticize police handling of the case and have hired private investigators, further indicating a personal quest for justice, not financial gain. Despite exhaustive efforts, over 1 to 200 tips, 250 interviews and 41 warrants, no breakthroughs have come in over five years. With $35 million on the line, it's shocking no one has come forward. Harry's risky behavior, suing relentlessly and feuding with family, put a target on his back, which he acknowledged. Yet he took no security precautions that could have caught the killer. This seeming contradiction between caution and recklessness adds to the mystery. Five years on, the grisly double murder of two billionaires remains among the world's most perplexing cold cases. Critical questions linger. Was it business related? Personal? Vengeance? Does a twisted thrill kill? Some hold out hope, but for many, doubts grow that there will ever be resolution. The Sherman's lives were cut short by someone brazen enough to stage an elaborate crime scene, yet disciplined enough to keep quiet. Such a combination of callousness and calm calculation is as rare as this case, which is tragic. For now, the truth of what happened in that mansion remains locked away, but the public fascination endures, and that's the incredibly tragic and perplexing case of the Sherman murders. If you found this mystery intriguing, hit like and make sure to subscribe to get alerts on future true crime videos. Also, feel free to share this video to spread awareness of this unresolved case.